finance management. Public finance management is essential for any country in order to bring down the poverty and bring economic stability. So the expert person who is going to take us to the session is Dr. Crystal Hikaj. So he is, an, uh, he is currently a professor in the University of Albania, but he has handled a, while, uh, he has handled a vast profession vast field in the field of public finance management. He was, uh, uh, he was a financial controller in IPA project and he was, uh, and he was also held as an expert for uh, uh, financial debut and uh, dependent institutions. So without further delay, I'm handing over the session to Dr. Crystal. Over to you, doctor. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, so we have today this really important topic, especially in today's world. And we're going to talk today about understanding public financial management. Uh, I'm saying in today's world because we need public finance in order to manage everything, all the problematics that we have at the moment around the globe. Um, quickly about myself, as it was mentioned, uh, I've been working for the Ministry of Finance for the last 10 years of my career. I've had various positions starting from the uh, Directorate of Debt Management. Uh, from the back office, middle office, and front office. Then I went on to independent, dependent institutions of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, the Ministry of Finance in Albania has around 14 dependent institutions, and I was in charge of uh, their collaboration with the Ministry of Finance to go on as smooth as possible. And lastly, I went on on the, since we are on the edge of joining the EU, hopefully soon, we have been receiving a lot of uh, EPA funds, Instrument for Pre-Accession Funds, in order to be uh, ready when we join the EU. And I've been the coordinator for EPA funds for almost five years, mainly with projects from agricultural, transport, and of course, IT. Uh, the discussion today is mainly about uh, public finance and it will be focused on looking at the path that public finance has chosen on always trying to solve the economic solutions. This has been true over decades. It's true for the Albanian market, it's true for every market, because every time you have a problem, you go and look for solutions on the public finance uh, uh, lookout. Uh, although another part that is true, if we look at the role of public finance on recent years, we can see that has been changing. What do I mean by changes in the role of public finance? Uh, in a lot of cases, public finance has been seen as the big picture of the economy, which it really is. And being the big picture of the economy, we're looking always at different ways and trying to solve the problems in different ways. Now, to go in details. Uh, firstly, we keep things simple and let's start by a definition. Uh, public finance, of course, is a good definition in order to, in order to uh, manage the study of how government collects and spend money and real resources. It's um, important to understand the role of it. So at the end of the day, you know where you're going on. You know what you're going through. Uh, in order to uh, make this analysis, we divide the role of public finance into two analyses, positive analysis and normative analysis. What do we call a positive analysis on how does government collect or spend money? This is the part where we focus on the logic of a positive analysis in order to understand on where the money is coming from. On the other hand, we have the normative analysis on which, which focuses on how should government collect or spend money, which um, the logic in here is through taxation, of course. Uh, in order to understand the policies of taxation, I've put in here, you have in the slide, the re recent trends in the uh, most upcoming years, which uh, have been the uh, most famous one in the history of PFM. Reagan tax cut, what happened? Uh, of course, we had a tax cut which was never seen in the history of the US. The economy started to shrink and a lot of things changed in the US economy. Uh, we have another expression from the government, uh, Governor Norquist, that if you shrink the government down to the size where you can draw, uh, draw it in a bathtub, is actually true for many governments nowadays. 
Bill Clinton said when he was the U.S. president that the area of big government is over. Is over. What the relation of it with the public finance? Because in order to save money, at the end of the day, you need to have a small government. Now, today, in today's world, especially in Asia and in some uh, uh, countries across Europe, this is what they're following through. Unfortunately, in Eastern Europe, including Albania, we are looking at really big governments for such small economies, which is uh, goes cons with the logic of public finance and the logic of Bill Clinton. And of course, last but not least, we had the Bush tax cuts, which was the most recent one. But today we say that we are looking at the free market ideology, which means that every economy should test the public finance in order to make sense uh, on what's going on, on uh, what the economy is producing and how it is producing. Sorry, okay. We have now, uh, of course, we can agree all that we are part in here that the best example to follow on public finance and every, on anything else, literally, is the US. So I've taken as, as an example on how the uh, federal government receives its revenue and does its expenditure. Because if we can understand the US economy, understanding some of the others, it might be quite simple because to be honest, in my experience with the US economy, it can be seen that it's a quite tricky economy with uh, mostly unknown things on the way. Where does the revenue come from, from the, uh, for the federal government, which is true for most of the government in all over the world? Duties, imports, excise, that must uh, be uniform throughout the US. Uh, we have also the federal income tax, which is, uh, has been through, through uh, the constitutional amendment on the 16th. We have the fifth amendment that can take away property without due process law, compensation requires, again, true for a lot of countries can tax articles exported from states, which the difference it might be for the US and some countries that they have the division of states, and of course, empowered to borrow money. On the other hand, we have the expenditure part, which again is true for a lot of countries, the path that they go through. We have in here the constitution that empowers the government to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. And bills to appropriate expenditures that can be initiated in either house or must be approved by both houses and president. Now, uh, this is a broad view. This is a broad view on how we can understand the big picture of revenue and expend expenditure. And in here, a lot of things might uh, be named in order to understand on specific names that can go on for the revenue and expenditure part. Uh, the logic in here, of course, is to try and understand uh, the public finance relations in it. In details in here, we're going to discuss about the tools of public finance. What does public finance, uh, how does public finance manage its economic path in the market? We have two set of tools that are considered as the most important one in public finance and dependent on how the uh, government might use them. There are many different ways that make, make sense for the market itself. Firstly, we have the theoretical tools that by definition is the set of tools designed to understand the mechanics behind economic decision-making in here, you can have, of course, the fiscal policy part in order to understand how the economy is functioning. And the empirical tools part, which uh, it goes in detail uh, on analyzing the data and answer questions raised by theoretical analysis. These two need to follow path by path each other in order to make, to make um, good statements about the market and that the policies in the market are making sense about the economy. Otherwise, it won't make any sense uh, if we are trying to understand the market itself. The problem itself is that uh, you can't do one without the other. It's not that you can start with the empirical tools first and then go in theory. Firstly, you need the set of theoretical tools and then you can go on on the testing part. When we talk about PFM, 
of course, the uh, most important topic or one of the most important topics in PFM is government budget. In order to understand the government budget, there are a set of rules that need to make sense uh, on drafting it, making changes to it, and how are you going to test that this budget will cover all your needs? Now, don't forget, the government budget theoretically needs to put in details everyone needs of, of every citizen needs of the country. Now, it might be simple for some countries with low population, but with some countries in the world that have a really high population, it's really difficult to include every citizen's needs in the budget because this is the logic of PFM. This is the uh, management of partly uh, public finances through the budget. In order to include everyone needs in the budget, you need to be really careful. And that's why before doing the budget, there are a lot of discussions, a lot of questionnaires being made. And that, in here is the part of the empirical tools, a lot of analysis uh, that probably if you go on further on more on the analysis of the theoretical part, the numbers need to make sense in here. Uh, again, in the budget part, uh, the budget part, of course, it starts with the role of a government. And mentioning just before that you need to include every citizen needs, every citizen um, questions, in the budget, in the PFM. The role of, gov of government, of course, the first one is to maintain and improve the welfare of the people. How is this done? Of course, through public finance, through the management of all the tools and policies that are in charge of public finance. Another one <clears throat> is to protect the people from harm. Of course, through defense, but we'll go back again to the budget because now, especially in the US, since we got the first example from the US, a big chunk of the budget goes for defense. To provide the institutions that allow market to function, protection of property rights is an example of one meaning by, uh, by that. Uh, protection of property rights is the best example that actually it makes sense on what the role of the government. To provide the essential goods and services that market fail to adequately provide. Of course, this year uh, is one of the main roles and uh, let's make the question differently. Let's rephrase the question differently. Can a government or can a market function if this wasn't the role of the government? Actually, it might be almost impossible. And there are a lot of economists who have tried and it hasn't functioned or it has functioned with a lot of problematics and the chain of command, the chain of the market itself has stopped working properly. In order to understand that, of course, we have two views of government. We have the organic and the mechanic view of government, and this is dependent on what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day. It's important that for this one, uh, it makes sense what you want to achieve with the your PFM at the end of the day. Uh, the logic is that we are looking at really important uh, distinctions between the views of government. If we're looking at an organic government, it, we're looking at options that the government has been increasing in an organic way, looking through changes that the market has uh, imposed in a way to them rather than a mechanic one, which mainly is true for all the countries in Eastern Europe, including Albania, that have gone through changes mainly through political parties or mainly because they are trying to do experiments with their PFM. Uh, in PFM, we have a division between state and local governments. Of course, there are some countries, may US may is uh, one of them, that they have three layers of government. We have the state, we have the government, and we have the local one. Of course, in here, you will need a really good uh, public finance management skills, which they do, in order to make clear the distinction between the three layers. Because otherwise, if you are trying to balance uh, the distinction between them and leaving each one the importance 
on the daily needs of the citizens, it might get really tricky. It might get really difficult to manage. Uh, what is true in theory is that states have power not explicitly relegated to federal government, which means that uh, true for the US, uh, in here is the distinction of what's really important in terms of managing also the income, the revenue through the division between state and local governments. Uh, they can't impose duties on imports and exports and the power of local government granted by states, which is really important in order to make this distinction that I was just mentioning to you. Uh, back to government budget, as I mentioned, it was really important in order to understand the uh, importance of the PFM as a definition, uh, which is, I try to keep things really simple in order for everyone to understand. And this comes, of course, for the background as a lecturer in order to understand everyone why I mean by the sentences that I put in the slides. By definition, and this is a really simple definition, the government budget or any budget, you can start even by a personal budget, is a tool used by individuals, businesses and governments to predict flows of money over a period of time, usually a year. And it's really important in order to understand the logic of it. A household budget lists all the sources of money for that household, such as wages from a job, loans from friends, rents, and all the ways in which money will be spent. And actually, this is why I recommend to everyone, in order to understand the government budget, which technically we can all agree on that is the biggest financial statement that you need to prepare, let's start from the simple things. The logic is the same. You have revenue in a financial, uh, uh, sorry, in a household budget, which is the wage, and might be other forms of it, and the expenditure part. In here, the revenue we call taxes, just to sum up, and the expenditures part, which can be a variety of. The technicality is the same. What do we call things in between? It's different. A government budget uh, is the document that presents to the government the forecast revenues and forecast spending for a financial year. Uh, usually, the budget is composed from two names, revenues and expenditures. And of course, the revenues, most of government revenues comes through taxation. Let's go on details on what do they come the revenues from. Uh, the revenues mainly come from two sources of revenue, tax revenue and non-tax revenue. We're going to go into details on what each one of them means in order so you understand and if you have any question on if you don't understand any of them please let me know the uh mainly difference between of course is that on tax revenues we have the income gained through taxation and taxation can be taxes can be a direct tax or an indirect tax a direct tax can be uh by definition taxes paid directly by the person or entity an indirect tax is the sales tax. What might uh, probably not have seen it before or not have been mentioned it before is the non-tax revenue part, which is true for a lot of countries, which it makes sense for a lot of countries. And in order to understand the logic of it, um, I've given you some examples that uh, there are countries that make a law of revenue through the non-tax part. Interest on loans that it gives. So any form of interest that is uh, indeed an important part of what it goes through on how the economy is approaching any financial crisis that it might come. This, of course, is not true for a lot of countries because no lot of countries have the power to give loan to other especially in today's world. Mainly in here, we're looking at countries in the Middle East and of course the US. Aid from abroad, this is a non-tax revenue. Uh, in here, we have a lot of examples and the uh, 
aid from abroad can be even an tangible or an intangible asset in the form of a financial aid. Revenue from concessions, true for a lot of countries, especially concessions are uh, right now really fashionable in the Albanian market and the Eastern European market. Uh, it's a huge debate if it's the right choice. I don't want to go there because it's another uh, form of PFM, uh, of public finance management. Fine fees on permits, permits, licenses is form of non-tax revenue. And of course, the last but not least, we have proceeds from sale of government goods and assets. Um, this is all example of non-tax revenue, uh, depending depending sorry depending on uh what's the importance in here uh there are a lot of governments who have made a lot of money from this part of non-tax revenue but again you are looking at the budget through the financial year and through the most important forms that you are trying to manage the revenue that you want for the uh budget of this year we go on, on types of taxation. Uh, types of taxation, just quickly, uh, in order to look on the views of the theoretical part on how a government can uh, achieve to get revenue from the market through the taxation part. Uh, of course, the most famous one in any country is the uh, taxes on earnings, the payroll tax, anyone with an income, uh, that pays the payroll tax annually, monthly, is dependent on the fiscal policy that is in power. Taxes on individual income, we have individual income tax. Uh, in here, we have the taxes paid on individual income accrued during the year, uh, especially uh, dependent on also the type of taxation that you have at the beginning. This might come true, and this might be a discussion if this is the right approach to follow. Uh, capital gains, earnings from selling capital assets, such as stocks, painting, and houses. There are a lot of countries that have, of course, different taxation parts. Uh, uh, in order to understand the logic on how it's functioning, uh, it might be important to understand on how it is functioning the economy. So you go and experiment with type of taxes that might be needed in the market itself. What is true is that there are a lot of countries that in capital gains tax have even tax on lottery. So in a funny part, you don't know if you don't if you should be happy if you that you won the lottery or should be sad because probably in some cases more than forty percent of that uh, lottery that you gained is going to be taxed and it's going to go to the government. Anyway, it's enough for its left, but still, what I'm trying to tell you is that taxation, some parts, of course, it's not uh, a happy thing for everyone. Uh, another form of taxation can be taxes on consumption. And it's really important in order to understand, to understand the uh, tax paid on individual or household consumption of goods. The important part, part is that the sales tax and excess tax is a form of taxes on consumption. Sales tax, by definition, is taxes paid by consumers to vendors at the point of sale, whereas excise tax is a tax paid on the sales of particular goods, for example, cigarettes or gasoline. Uh, even in here, there are a lot of debates what the level of sales tax should be, uh, especially since we're talking about the tax that it has a direct impact on the uh, people's money, people's uh, pockets. Whereas the excise tax is a type of tax that are, especially even during the year, there are done a lot of experiments with it. Because with an excise tax, you can help uh, the prevention of some goods in order to sell less of that good, especially the uh, cigarettes part. Right now, mainly in Europe, uh, this excise tax has been following the rule that I was just mentioned to you. Uh, a lot of countries, since we have the increase in the prices of diesel, uh, diesel and gasoline, are playing with the excise tax in order to manage the uh, 
the price of the good in the market. Whereas we have, on the other hand, the cigarettes and the um, alcohol, which again, it, they play with it in order to reduce the usage of it in the market. Um, from the books that I've used in order to make this presentation, I found this really beautiful picture in order to, uh, to show to you how the PFM literally is all about taxes. Uh, how about no new taxes after these new taxes? Uh, a lot of countries try to solve any of the issues in the market through the uh, part that is really important to understand all of it in order to manage the biggest problem that might come from the new taxes. Because just me let, you, let me tell you one thing that I've uh, seen in practice. For a new tax, in order to make sense for the market, you need to wait at least two months, three months in order to receive the feedback from the market. So it's not that uh, you can make changes throughout the year. Of course, there are a lot of examples uh, uh, in a lot of countries that uh, imposing new taxes to the market, the market might have the uh, reverse feedback, reverse impact that what you wanted or what you had in mind with that. And that is true, especially in the uh, uh, South American countries. Uh, the law of the, their crisis have come because of imposing to the market new taxes and not letting time uh, to manage or to give time to the market to start uh, working with all the uh, new things that were coming to it. Type of uh, taxation to go on. Now we saw some of them, but uh, I think it's really important no to understand uh, how the market is functioning. Uh, the biggest discussion today is taxes on corporate income. In order to understand the uh, market's functions, the logic on how they are distributed. Of course, we have taxes on corporate income, which is tax divided on the earning of corporations. And this is a massive chunk for the government budget and of any budget uh, uh, in the world. And the big name that has a lot of abstraction to it is taxes on wealth. Wealth taxes are taxes paid on the value of the asset held by a person or family. We have the property tax part, which is another uh, logic on trying to understand uh, the market itself. Uh, we have the estate tax, which of course is a form of wealth tax based on the value of the estate left behind when one dies. And again here, uh, we're talking about the form of uh, inheritance. Now, let's go on on the big picture. We're talking about fiscal federalism. The fiscal federalism is uh, what we call the role of the US PFM. How the US economy uses the public finance management in order to make sense of it in the market. Uh, the United States has a federal system dividing activity between a national and uh, government, national government and state and local governments, which I mentioned to you before that in here we have three layers of government. Uh, this is the form where through fiscal federalism, you uh, divide education uh, in state governments. There are a lot of debates, not only in the US, but through a lot of countries in the world that uh, the important issue of what we call an optimal fiscal federalism is which activities should take place at which level of government. This debate, of course, it comes from uh, mainly through the question on which level of government will receive the income for that tax which level of government uh, 
will have the right on spending the money for that tech. And in here, the biggest debate that comes from it is, of course, if we look today in a lot of countries, that we have the municipalities need for independence. The municipalities need for independence is based in here, which uh, if they have income themselves, we don't need, we don't have the need to go and ask the uh, the big government for a chunk of money. Just on the logic of uh, optimal fiscal uh, federalism, we have the types of grants. So in order, in here we understand on how money is transferred between the two, the layers of uh, government. Um, there are, grants can be given in different forms. Many, many, many. In theory and in practice, they uh, can be divided into three main grants in order to understand even of uh, how money are transferred between one and another. So the first option, the first type of uh, grant is a block grant, which means by definition is a grant of some amount with no mandate as to how it is spent. So we mentioned before a form of non-tax revenue is aid from abroad. Just to give you an example, let's presume that, that that's a financial aid. So I give you money, but you don't have uh, to show me any invoice on what you spend that money that I gave to you. There are forms of it. Uh, we as an Albanian economy, we have had a lot of block grants in the past and even right now. Uh, but mainly, most of the countries receive financial aid, as we're talking about financial aid, through conditional block grants, uh, which is a grant of some amount with a mandate on how it is spent. What does it mean? It means that I'm giving you this financial aid because you need it for that purpose. Uh, we had a lot of grants from the EU lately because we let, we had the earthquake two years ago and we have had around 1 billion euros uh, gathered from the EU for us, but with uh, was a conditional block grant on the uh, money uh, with the mandate that it will be spent for the earthquake. We can't spend anything, any of the money received from us on anything else, just on the earthquake. And last but not least is a matching grant, uh, which means by definition that the amount of which is tied to the amount of spending by the local community. In here, we're talking about a clear relationship between the big government and the small government, as I like to call them, which means by, with, by it, I mean the big government considering the government, the Ministry of Finance, Prime Minister's office, and the small government, the municipalities, which in here, Again, the distinction should be made in order to have the grants needed to make uh, the distinction in types of how you're receiving the revenue and how you're spending it. Uh, because again, for me, it makes sense the uh, uh, independence part on the municipality side. When we talk about the PFM, of course, we cannot leave out the most important topic of PFM. Uh, public debt. One of the biggest debates today is we hear a lot of noises about the public debt. The public debt has gone around 60%, 90%, 104%. Uh, why do we have the public debt at these levels? Why do we just pay off the debt? I put this slide in here because right now, it's a big debate, especially in the US, especially in the EU. Why you have this level of public debt where some of the G20 countries have it in their constitution that they can produce money overnight and reduce the level of public debt? Well, uh, it's a huge debate actually. Uh, where a huge debate, there is no clear answer that this is the best solution. This is the uh, uh, way that you can follow it in order to understand on uh, how it makes sense. 
the biggest problem today is trying to find the uh, way that has minor problematics in the market itself. Let's presume that the US produces money overnight and reduces the, public, the level of public debt at zero. What's going to happen the next morning? Trust me, you're going to have an economy in hyperinflation. Hyperinflation, it kills the economy, even the US one. So it's not that simple. It's not that you can uh, find a solution overnight. It's not that uh, on trying to find this solution or to solve this problem, you create uh, other bigger problems uh, just because you try to solve this one. Uh, focus is just on the EU part. We have the uh, Master's Treaty. The Master's Treaty, of course, uh, was uh, in the 90s in Netherlands, and they decided that the level of the excessive debt uh, annexed to the Maastricht Treaty specifies that the ratio of gross government debt to GDP must not exceed 60% at the end of the preceding fiscal year. Now, of course, we're going to look at some graphs later that uh, this is true for the US, but for the most of the countries, because now Right now, this is an EU entry requirement. And the best, best example I can give it to you is, of course, the Albanian market. Uh, going back on showing you some graphs, so it makes sense on what I was saying to you. In here, you have a graph of the 2020 uh, uh, fiscal year. And with the question on how does the federal government spend its money? And as you can see, uh, a big chunk goes to uh, education, a big chunk goes to healthcare, a big chunk goes to pension funds, a big chunk goes to defense and welfare. So this is the distribution of income for the uh, uh, federal budget. Uh, from all the budget that I've seen on when I've been working for a lot of, uh, for the Ministry of Finance and I've seen quite a lot of budgets of other countries, Almost this is the same distribution with the minor um, uh, minor distinction about the defense. Because as we know, US leaves a big chunk of money for the defense part. Uh, and this is not true for uh, a lot of countries. Let's make that graph in numbers. So what does it mean? In here, we're talking about uh, government spending and Usually, when we talk about government spending, you in the US, we're talking about trillions. We're not talking about billions anymore. Uh, uh, to go more in details, uh, let's have a clear picture on how do they receive the money and how do they spend it. Uh, they receive the money, as I mentioned to you before, from corporate income tax, excise tax, others. But as you can see, the biggest chunk that they they receive is through payroll tax and individual income tax. So it's not the businesses, are the individuals. And of course, the other form of it that goes on the other part that we saw before. Uh, quickly, how do these changes in income affect demand? You can see this on two forms, in uh, normal goods and inferior goods. By definition, the uh, Definition of normal goods is goods for which demand increases as income rises, uh, and inferior goods, goods for which demand falls as income rises. On the same level, we have the budget constraints. The budget constraints, by definition, is a mathematical representation of all the combinations of goods an, an individual can afford to buy if she spends uh, her entire income. In the form of that, we have the form of opportunity cost, and the uh, definition of it, you have it in the slides. Uh, following on the budget, we have uh, the budget process that distinguishes between two types. Uh, in the budget, we have two forms of spending. We have the uh, entitlement spending and the discretionary spending. The entitlement spending, by definition, are mandatory, mandatory funds or programs for which funding levels are automatically set by the number of eligible recipients, or 
discretionary, discretionary spending, optional spending set by appropriation levels each year. Of course, if we're talking about the US, since in here we have the US example, we're talking about Congress discretion on both parts. Uh, the budget policies are set to be uh, on a requirement that you need at least a balanced budget requirement used by many states. Uh, theoretically, I can say that is really difficult to make it in theory. In practice, it might be a uh, little bit easier, but at the end of the day, uh, it's true on everything. Uh, we have the balanced budget requirement, which is a law forcing a given government to balance its budget each year, which means spending equals revenue. Almost impossible, almost impossible, because don't forget uh, the revenue part is a prediction. And although you at the beginning of the year, you might have it as a balanced budget, you might not achieve during the year to uh, receive that income that you had predicted. We have uh, two forms of BBR, balanced budget requirement, ex post and ex ante, and both uh, differ on the timing, on how it is imposed. Uh, the US, of course, so let's uh, go through quickly on understanding the US economy, because as I said, uh, mainly uh, everything on the PFM is related to them. The current US budgeting approach uh, scores policies in on a 10 year window, replaces one and five year windows used before 96, avoids imposing assumptions about revenue and expenditure in the very distant future. And of course, we're talking that everything uh, goes smooth, is really difficult, not saying impossible, to forecast over a five year period because the latest period have proven this, you might have things that you can never predict. Uh, in the US, the numbers are frightening. As you can see, the di uh, difference in actual and projected de deficit can be more than 500 billion. Have a look at this uh, graph, please. Uh, in here, what makes sense on what I told you before? Uh, we have the US on the uh, time frame from 1972 to 2032. Of course, after 22, we have a projection. Uh, difference, as you can see, we have always a difference between projection and actual, or actual and projection. So it's really difficult of making sense of what we said in here at, at last to have a five year time frame period in order to make sense of what is going on uh, the uh, logic of it is to try and understand uh, the outcome that comes from it and how you're going to react of, on it in the future uh, this is a really important graph uh, uh, sorry uh, picture on trying to understand the logic of what we're discussing before the master treaty would declare that the EU entry requirement needs the level of public debt at 60%. Uh, in here, you're looking at countries that have more than 120% level of public debt. Uh, uh, countries that have forgotten on the 60% and are countries that are part of the EU. Our biggest debate right now in Albania is this one. We want to be part of the European Union. Hopefully we'll be soon in the European Union in order to understand on what's going on and make sense on all the numbers that are uh, going through the economy. Right now, we are far away as an economy from the 60%. We are at public level debt of 97%, uh, which means that we need to go drop it down to 60%. With that, with the PFM and fiscal policy, uh, it's really difficult at the moment to make sense of these numbers. Actually, uh, uh, the logic of it, in order to make sense on how it can be approached, is that in order to make sense of these numbers, you make projections. And from the projections that we have made as a, uh, on the PFM, Albania should join the EU in a five-year time, 
if we have this entry requirement, but as you can see from the picture, uh, most of the countries are on the over 60. You have Italy that is around 120 right now, Greece that of course it's a big problem. And only some of the Eastern European countries uh, have a level of lower than 60%. Uh, and mainly that be, uh, has come because most of their debt came from, uh, was uh, taken by someone else from the division that we had in there. Another graph in details on what's going on on the EU uh, in order to understand the logic of its division. And of course, as you can see, the threshold that is in there is around 60%. Uh, in here, to make sense of why I'm talking to you, as you can see, there are a tiny number of countries that have the uh, number of public debt lower than 60%. One of the most important questions in uh, PFM is why we care about the deficit. In order to uh, understand that, of course, the government budget deficit has implications for both efficiency and equality. The budget deficit can affect the amount of savings and growth in the economy. Today's deficit are tomorrow's taxes, so high deficits imply redistribution from future to current generations. And last but not least, so we keep on the timing schedule, we have the PFM. The PFM, uh, as a sum up on what I've been telling to you, the definition of PFM is that uh, it refers to the collection, management, and expenditures of public finance throughout an economy. Um, it's a mixture of all three, actually, on trying to understand how the economy is booming, how you're doing it, how you're performing it, in order to understand everything and its importance of it in the market. It's actually true uh, that the combination of these three it what makes sense on how the market is functioning, on how the economy at that market is functioning. Uh, PFM has uh, four really important objectives. Uh, in order to understand uh, it, we have, of course, we need to uh, the aggregate fiscal discipline, strategic allocation of resources, operational efficiency, and of course, efficient public service delivery. Going back to the budget cycle, because in here we need the importance of it, and we mentioned the importance of it. Uh, the budget cycle goes through six really important phases. Firstly, we start with the review policy. We then go on on the update strategy and policy, budget preparation, budget execution, budget uh, accounting and monitoring of the budget, and last but not least, reporting and auditing. Uh, when we go on the budget preparation phase, we look at budget content, uh, capital budget, medium-term expenditure frameworks, linking budgets to policy, program budgeting, and of course, performance-based budgeting in order to understand how we can uh, uh, compose of it and make sense of it in the market itself. Uh, the most important part, of course, is budget execution. Because in here, you are putting in life everything that you have written on paper. We're talking about the fine art of spending. We're talking about uh, the ways of spending the budget in four, spend, in four steps. We're talking about commitment controls. We're talking about cash management. We're talking about budget alterations, public procurement intergovernmental fiscal transfers, internal control, and automation. Accounting and monitoring, we're talking about accounting, cash versus accrual accounting, financial reporting, and budget uh, monitoring. Last but not least, we're talking about reporting and auditing. Uh, reporting and auditing, it's a legislative oversight. And of course, you need to go back in here on the reforming of the PFM legal framework. One of the most important discussions in 
all the literature is what's the role of the BFM in the economy. In order to make sense of that, of course, we need the basic economic equilibrium model. In here, uh, the discussion is, of course, budget deficit and debt finance. This is the name that moves everything in this equation, and that's why uh, I paid a great importance to the level of public debt on the economy. I took the EU as an example because the Master Street team pawns that level of 60%, but as you can see that the uh, role of PFM based on the budget deficit and debt financing is quite enormous. The PFM system is that it's divided into four really important uh, pillars. It has the role of facilitating the transfers of funds directly to the account of beneficiaries, provides effective decision support system tracking of funds, real-time information on resource availability and utilization across schemes, integration with the application of government department ministries for online collection of their receipts. Uh, financing the budget deficit, we're talking about borrowing domestically or externally, selling assets, printing money. These are the forms that a government has in hand in order if it wants to uh, to adapt the economy's needs in the market itself. Printing money, as I mentioned to you, is an option, but of course it has a lot of problematics on how it can be spent in the market itself, how it can react the market itself in this way. Selling assets, of course, is really easy. Uh, of course, the biggest debate in here, when we sell assets that are a lot of countries that do it, you're losing the sovereignty of the country. Uh, when we talk about this, of course, we have the crowding out effect. And that's why I mentioned to you from the beginning that uh, in here, you should be really careful on trying to understand uh, uh, the logic on how it functions in order to understand the outcome that can come from it. The reduction of private sector consumption or investment resulting from additional government uh, financing or deficit. Debt sustainability, uh, the ability of a country to meet current and future debt service obligations in full. We're talking at the uh, future economic stability, growth development and poverty reduction. Of course, this can be through done through fiscal management and direct access to uh, capital markets. Two really important questions that we're coming to the end, and I welcome the floor for questions then, on what are the challenges of the PFM? Uh, I think that PFM in the future will have four important uh, challenges that they need to be managed quickly and thoroughly by each government by, of each country. We're talking about the creation of independent fiscal institutions, the fiscal responsibility laws, fiscal rules, management of fiscal risks. Each and every one of them has its needs, its projections, uh, how they're going to be managed in order to save the economy from any problematics that might come from it and the reaction of the market. Uh, are there room for improvements? Of course. In the PFM, as I mentioned to you from uh, slide one of this lecture, that mainly the PM, PFM is seen as an experiment. So we're looking at improvements in leadership. We're looking at improvements on the space given to policies in order to develop the appropriate reforms. And we're looking at adaptive, literative and inclusive processes during the way. This was my last slide. Uh, hi, am I with timing? Yeah, we're good with timing. So I leave the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, doctor. It was a wonderful session, actually very interesting, very enriching and very deep knowledge too. So now the pa uh, panel is now open. Participants can post your question in the question and answer session and uh, each questions will be addressed one by one. So actually, okay. uh, 
uh, doctor, there is a lot, uh, a lot of number of questions coming up, and everybody is enjoying the presentation too. All right, brilliant. Yeah, Thank I'll start much. with posing one one question. Yes, let us uh, begin with the first question. Okay. So, yeah. So there is uh, one particular question that is coming up is like uh, uh, Cassandra is asking, Walter Cassandra is asking, how doctors, is it normal for a country to always present a deficit budget? <laughs> uh, it's the only way that it can work because as I mentioned to you in the slides, uh, any country, well, some of the countries have the right to produce money overnight and they can solve the deficit. But it's the way on how it functions the economy. Uh, if because if you look at the budget itself, most of it, uh, most of the budget that comes uh, of the income that comes through taxes, it's given out to pay the deficit part, uh, and it's seen even as a way uh, a motivation in order to increase the level of taxes. And this is the circle of economy. Other ways it wouldn't function. If we didn't have deficit, there wouldn't be anything to worry. About. Again, coming back to the logic that I mentioned to you, uh, <clears throat> when we are in a personal budget, with a deficit, we call it a loan. Think of it this way. If you don't, didn't have a loan, would you be motivated to do things quicker, to do things different way? I hope I answered your questions. Uh, I, yeah, I guess like uh, Kesinda's question is answered. So like a next question has been posted by Abu Bakr. Uh, he's asking if, is there any amount of percentage in fixed amount that could be allocated to each subhead? That is for any um, health department or education department. So I say it again, is it? Uh, is there any certain amount or percentage in the fixed amount that could be allocated ah. for each department? Uh, no, I mean, you cannot say that the amount uh, it's a projection and you might need during the way to make a lot of changes. For example, uh, in the last couple of years, you had COVID. Uh, you might have projected that for the Ministry of Health, it will go an X amount of money. But during that year, you had to make changes to the government budget in order to leave much more money for the Ministry of Health because it was the situation like that. Right now, uh, from the war in Ukraine, a lot of countries are leaving much more money to the uh, defense part, especially uh, countries in Europe. You, you have the example of Germany. Germany uh, didn't use to leave a lot of money for the defense part, but now it's changing the policy, it's changing the way of thinking. So uh, to answer your question clearly, no, you can't do that. You can have a draft, of course, because it's a projection how things can go. But at the end, you can look uh, uh, each month on how this draft is going and if, if, if the economy is needing more. Okay. Yes, I guess uh, Abu Bakr's question is answered clear now. I think Abu Bakr, now we are clear with your question. So next question is part, uh, posed by Smart Nigwera. He's asking why is that uh, many government have difficulties in terms of balancing the situation, citizens' needs or all sectors when making a budget? Um, that's dependent on each country, I think, because um, when you do the, uh, when you have start to prepare the budget, drafting the budget, the first uh, set of rules is that you look at last year's budget. And in here, it's a mixture of even political needs, political views, uh, and how you're looking at it. The biggest problem I'm talking about practice come uh, on who are you asking on the future of the budget. Uh, usually the uh, budget is prepared uh, on the logic of Chamber of Commerces because at the end of the day, the businesses are the ones that are in need of using the government's money mainly through investments and uh, through uh, every other part that the government can make. So in order to make sense of that, of course, the first, uh, people that should be asked so that are the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, to answer your question in a different way, uh, can you answer uh, a law, can you que uh, question a lot of people on what are the views of the budget? It's impossible. 
And that's why we go in political terms. Since you have voted for that political party, it means that you have agreed on their views about the budget. And of course, the other part, it will be difficult to compose. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, I think uh, there's an appreciation actually. Like he enjoyed the uh, presentation and he, he felt it, it was very good. And uh, Florinda is asking, what's the accounting treatment of grants based on the milestones and in which category do they fall into? Once again, please, sorry. Yeah. Can you? What's the accounting treatment of grants based on the milestones and which category do they fall into? Are you looking at a particular example or just talking about the examples that I have given to you? Yeah, Florida's, I think Florida's question, Florence Odida's question is not much clear. And um, there is one more question. Is it possible that, um, like uh, he has presented a case here, an, an anonymous attendee has presented it. A president has a previous case of plunder. His mother has a case. So like, I don't think so. This is a, uh, he's asking, if is it possible that their family will go to jail if they can't pay their uh, billion dollar debt, 200 billion debt? Is this national <laughs> money and tax? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a PFM problem, trust me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let us move on to the next question. Uh, what is, uh, there is a question from Bicock. He's asking, what is your uh, country on the opinion having central payment account for internal and ex external expenses? Well, uh, it doesn't function anywhere else. You're going to need to have a central account. It should be in a central bank. And all the payments should be done through the Treasury Department of the Ministry of Finance. It cannot function anyway. So I don't know if you have something in mind that there are other forms of organizing the payments of, uh, payments of expenditure, but there are now other in my knowledge. Okay, okay, clear now. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, yeah. uh, there is a question from Peter. He's asking, why is that some governments to imbalance in budget allocation and risk privilege the sensitive sectors like health and education? I didn't mention anything about that. I just said that uh, this is what I give you some numbers about the US. And uh, it's dependent on each country and how they uh, project to spend the money in the, uh, in the future and in the near future on the year that is coming on how they make the distribution of income on the uh, basic market needs that the government might have. Uh, coming back to the previous question that we had, uh, it's dependent on each year on how you're trying to achieve what your uh, goals are for the government budget. It's not on me to make comments on any country. It's not on me and it's not my duty and I can't really make because I'm not an expert on every market. I know some markets, but at the end of the day, I was just talking about the theoretical part of things. Okay. Uh, so there is another question from Deepika. She's asking how public finance management will be evolving in coming years? Will be in Albania in the upcoming years? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, the biggest, as I mentioned to you in the last slides, while well, the challenges of PFM, and let's take the Albanian uh, case, for example, uh, of course, the fiscal responsibility part will be a great debate on when we, we want to try to achieve uh, the best we can and the on the fastest way we can the level of public debt at near 60% because we are far away from it. And at the same time, we need to manage uh, the fiscal risk because if you are trying to solve the problem, you, you might arise, and as I mentioned to you many times in the slides, you might arise on other problems and the problems that might arise might be much more difficult to solve than the one that you've solved already. Okay. So there is another question from Wellington. He's asking, how can companies perform budgeting in a volatile market? In a? Volatile market. Uh, um, well, we are outside of the area of PFM in here because we are talking about companies. But uh, just to quickly answer your question on my experience and on my opinion, uh, 
it depend it's dependent on what the volatility of the market it's coming from if we're talking about a normal market volatility uh, you should see the path of the market on how it has behaved from in the last three to five years and based on that you need to prepare the first the budget forecast from the upcoming year if we are looking at projections for financial crisis then you need to start the discussion and leave money out uh, as savings in order to have them on a bad day. Okay. I think Wellington's question is answered now. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Peter, is asked, Peter has asked a question. His question is, why is that some governments to imbalance in budget allocation and less privilege the sensitive sectors? Like I think that question is answered. I'm sorry. Yeah. I will yeah. move on to the next question. Uh, Isaac is asking, uh, is it possible for a country to record economic growth when it is faced with debt uncertain unsustainability? Well, yes, it is possible because uh, many countries in today's world, they have the debt unsustainability. But the problem is on uh, you're trying to achieve the best of both. Uh, on how big the growth can be, that's a different uh, conclusion, that's a different question, and I can't give you a clear answer on that. But yes, it is possible, and a lot of countries are doing it. We're talking about all the Eastern European countries, we're talking about uh, some of the uh, Latin countries of Latin America that are actually doing it, so it, it can be done. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, like, I'll uh, post the next question. Um, Just a minute. Uh, yeah, in relation, uh, there's a question from Dakan. He's asking, in relation to debt sustainability, what is the implication of imposing a debt ceiling beyond which a government cannot borrow? He's asking actually two questions. I uh, like. I'll ask one by one. Okay. He's asking like, in relation to debt sustainability, what's the implication of imposing a debt ceiling beyond which a government cannot borrow? Uh. Actually, that's um, uh, a way of thinking that many governments have thought so. And actually, uh, we as an Albanian economy have, have had something like that, that uh, 10 years ago, we had a debt ceiling of 60% or based on the Master's Treaty in order to not go over 60%. And it was changed uh, to not having a ceiling with uh, the parliament approval. Um, you can have it. And of course, it will be a form of trying to prevent the uh, government on not passing that ceiling. But other than that, it won't do anything because if we're talking about the uh, uh, republic that have a parliament ruling and they can change it easily because it's not even a majority voting, it's not that it's, uh, it's really helpful on the uh, upcoming future. Other than that, it's a good policy just to prevent and just to make sure that the government knows that it's in there, but it's not a good functioning role and it helps that it will help the government a lot. Okay, uh, his second part of the question is, uh, in the same breath, how, how much money can the central bank print without precipitating inflation? Uh, they have the right to produce any amount of money that they want, but this needs to be done based on actual studies from the market. It's not that the government can wake up one morning and say that I need to produce $2 billion tonight. These are actual studies made from the market in order to understand on money needs and need to worry about inflation in the upcoming market. Uh, an increase in cash circulation, which can be done without... Uh, proper studies using all the uh, uh, econometric studies that are uh, made by for the market itself can be really dreadful for the economy. Okay, uh, I think now like his uh, questions have been answered clearly. Uh, there is one more question from Chingwok. He's asking, uh, he has actually posted an appreciation too. He has, uh, he has like appreciated the lecture and he has Thank asked you. to elaborate more on uh, matching grant with a real life example. Uh, yeah, sure. Matching grant is uh, the transfer between the big government uh, to the small government, as I mentioned to you in the slide. Big government being 
the uh, uh, Ministry of Finance and Prime Minister's Office and the small government being the municipalities. There are a lot of cases where the municipality asks for money to the uh, Ministry of Finance. Many cases, well, actually most of them. But in here, we're talking about money on that specific projects. For example, we need money in order to build that road. And the money is transferred in the same amount for that road. And we call this a matching rent. So I match your demand and I match your uh, amount of money. Okay. Uh, okay, I think his question is answered now clearly. That was an interesting question too. And uh, next question is being posted by Florence. Um, there are grants that have been given to government in tranche based on met preset targets or milestone. Would they be considered as revenue too? Uh, no. No, it's dependent on what's written in there. But if it's any form of financial aid, a financial aid, it's a form of non-tax revenue and that's clear. But it's dependent on what's written in there. So I have to look at it. Technically and theoretically, it's if it's transferred as a financial aid, uh, sorry, financial aid, it's a form of non-tax revenue. Okay. Yeah. There is another question from Kingsley. Okay. There are any alternative to public finance management in future? There are any? Alternative to public finance management in future. I doubt if it we if we don't have any alternative right now, which has been studying the PFM for almost 200 years, I doubt that the future can bring us anything. Uh, PFM will be always the same, although the technical technological part of it might, might change, but still the path of it will be always the same. Okay. So there's an uh, interesting question from Nestor. He's asking, does an independent public finance structure is necessary? An advantage is, it, uh, does it become advantage for any country to be incorporated in its constitution? Uh, it's unclear if by independent mean that having the division of Ministry of Finance and Central Bank. I don't understand that. Yeah, I think like he has posted like if it is having any uh, independent public finance structure. I think this question is quite uh, twisting. Nestor, you can uh, post a clear question if you want to have an answer. Uh, Isaac is asking, please, is it possible for a country to record? Yeah, I think that would have been answered. Sorry. Um, there is one more question from Boyd Cope. He's asking, like, who should know the budget? In every, uh, is it everyone or at the higher office alone? No, the budget should be open for everyone. I mean, this is the transparency part. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't think there is any country, in, and now I'm talking about the finalized budget, but the drafting part and the... Uh, before after before the finalization part of course is just ministry of finance but the finalized budget it's uh obligatory to be published on the website of the ministry of finance of any country if it's not done so then there is a problem with it and should be uh, should be seen at it but other than that it should be published on the website of every ministry of finance of the country okay uh, i uh, there is a question from Winston. he's asking I really want to understand clearly the effects of printing money to cover up deficits. Uh, the logic is that at the end of the day, um, as I asked, as I answered before, the uh, you're looking at things that might become bigger problems in the near future just because you printed the money out. So it's really difficult uh, for every government to come to that conclusion. Okay. Uh, there are more inter interesting questions coming up. Um, there is a question from Edger. He is asking, uh, since we, it was talked about improving public finance management, can you please expand on the last and why it is difficult for a country to resolve the issue of public debt overnight? No, it's impossible to solve the issue of public debt overnight. I just gave it as an example that there are countries that have the right to produce money, but they don't follow that right on producing money overnight because 
it might create problems with hyperinflation. But I never said that the public debt can be sold overnight. Okay. Uh, there is an appreciation from Conman Monga. He is saying that the presentation or the lecture was so educative, and you have uh, you have presented it very clearly. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll I'll post the next question. Okay. So there is a question from Isaac. He is asking how was debt uncertainability uh, does debt sustainability related to GDP? Debt sustainability related to G GDP. No. Uh, uh, of course, there is a type of management that you uh, are looking at ways of performing ratios uh, in order to uh, try to manage the outcome of it. But at the end of the day, this is just a relation that those two can have. Other than that, there is no other relation between the two. Okay. So there is a question from uh, Peter. He is asking, how can government reduce the public debt without leaving taxes on the ordinary persons? Uh, <laughs> this is dependent on the country. Okay. I mean, there is no clear answer uh, in here because uh, it's dependent on each country. Okay. So there is a question from Patson. He is asking, what is what influence does the IMF bailout on national budgeting? Uh, mainly through taxes. Okay. Mainly through taxes because it's imposed uh, on taxes on how uh, you perform it, on uh, imposing new taxes, on uh, even putting out taxes that they don't think is necessary. Uh, I've worked with IMF personally closely for the last four years because IMF is right now in Albania. Um, the idea with them is that they want to increase income at any case possible. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think like uh, this question is answered now. We'll move on to the next one. Abraham is asking, where can we place the grants that are given to students in universities and colleges? He wants to know which type of grant that is. That's a conditional block grant because it okay. is transferred with a mandate that is spent for students and colleges. Okay. That was a good question, Abraham. Uh, there is an, uh, another question from Lup, uh, Lup, Lupakskia. He's asking, is there an update, up-to-date assessment to key public finance management bottlenecks in health sector? Uh, no, I mean, there's, it doesn't mean that you can change the uh, policies on each year. The logic is that this is dependent on the PFM of each country, on how they make the division uh, uh, on each of the sectors. So, Okay. Uh, so next question is from Edward. He is asking, why is that borrowing from IMF always comes with conditionals and they are not mostly in the interest of the countries? <laughs> This is a million dollar question. Uh, the logic is that uh, it's dependent on the views of the Ministry of Finance and the Prime Minister's office. And so in there, I, in here I'm talking about theoretical part and views that come from an expert. In here we're talking about politics and I don't want to go there. Okay. Uh, he's asked, he has asked three questions actually. I'll have, I'm asking one by one. Next one is like he's asked, is deficit financing the way forward always? Is deficit financing the? Way forward always. Uh, no, I mean, uh, again, even in here, it's dependent on the views of the government and how they are trying to reach the goals that they have been set by them. Okay, okay. his third part of the question is, can't countries maintain a balanced budget? Impossible. Impossible because, as I mentioned in the slides, you can make the projection at the beginning of the year that the spending will equal revenue at the end of the year. But you have, God forbid, the COVID situation again. What are you going to do? You need extra money. So that equation is locked. Yeah. Uh, there is a question from Tom. He's asked, would you kindly detailed and uh, provide an explanation on budget policy? 
What do you mean budget policy? Yeah, he wants a detailed explanation on budget policy. Budget policy can be uh, on what you're looking uh, as a government to do with your budget. And there are various types of policies, if includes when we talk about the government budget that you can go through. But other than that, I don't know what you're looking for in a budget policy. Okay. Uh, that is, I think this is provided in brief answer, I think. Vasilov is asking, what is the implication of economy of a country that borrowed more to its finance reserves? Uh, in here, they might have been done because they didn't want to increase the level of public debt. And they didn't want to uh, use the opportunity of producing money. Okay. So there is a question from Dr. Adam. He's asking, what is the role of currency devaluation in solving budget deficits of a country rather than diversifying economy and improving re revenue generation? Quite a long time. Uh, in here, we might be a big problem because right now we have that problem even in Albania, the currency depreciation, and there is it, that's in a lot of countries because of the euro in the EU zone. So, of course, that's a problem if your public debt is in that currency, that it will help you because it means that you need to pay less to it. But other than that, of course, even the near future, it means that you need to leave less money for the deficit. But other than that, the currency depreciation, uh, it can be helpful even for some businesses on the uh, famous uh, NX imports and exports. But other than that, it's a big problem, especially if it happens to the local currency. Okay. There is a question from Luke Kizia. He's asking, do health budget formulation and implementation support alignment with the sector priorities and flexible resource use? Not directly, but of course, that might be a relation between them. And even in here, it might be a projection at the beginning of the year, but you'll see how it goes during the year. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Maron. He's asking what makes the government to borrow money when the uh, when they do come up with a budget? Uh, uh, in here, uh, not always you might, uh, the government revenue might be enough. And so just because of that, you might need, uh, you should have the possibility to uh, have more money. Usually in my experience, uh, government, borrows money mainly for investment. If government borrows money other than investment, we have a big problem because the government budget is not on the way as it should have been. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Nathan uh, Quash. He's asking if, can you please explain the types of taxation? It's everything in the slides. I don't know what else can I explain. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there is a question from an anonymous attendee. He's asking, what are some efficient and effective budget policies that a nation should institute and implement? Uh, it's dependent again on what you're trying to achieve as a country. If you're looking to achieve uh, a great uh, form on education, a great form on health, you're going to spend more on education and health. So it's dependent on what the government is looking forward to do with the money that it has. Okay. So there is a question from Amania. He's asking, uh, do you think developing countries can easily attain sustain, fin sustainable financial management without the interference of developed countries? Uh, <laughs> the, the logic is not this, at least not directly. Well, of course, uh, we're looking at expertise in developed countries. We're looking at even financial aid help in order uh, for us to be uh, as quickly as possible on their path. Okay. So there are many questions coming up. <laughs> it's interesting, actually. There is one more question from Toy Morris. He's asking, what are some efficient and effective budget policies that a nation should institute and implement? I think, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we have answered the question. Next one is, from ADQ, he is asking how can budget and budgetary control aids sustainable development in local governments? 
mainly through the distribution on the level of income and not leaving them a lot of taxes. Other than if they leave them a lot of taxes, then we will have this problem. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Younes. He is asking, what is the relationship between public finance management and public debt management? Public debt management is part of public financial management. A PFM is the big picture, whereas debt from the name, we're looking just as debt. Okay. Yeah, that's a simple question. And uh, there is another question from Dr. Adam. He's asking, we are now in the cryptocurrency era. Why are many central banks rejecting uh, or not embracing it as a part of legitimate earning? Uh, because if you do that, you uh, make legitimate all the problematics that come with the cryptocurrency. Because as you can see, a currency that has fluctuations within the day or goes so up and then it goes so down can never be part of the central bank logic. Other than that, uh, it's good for a market to have diversification, but it cannot function in that way. Okay. Uh, Felix is asking one question. He wants to know about what is tax rate and is it consistent? Is it consistently for every country? Is it consistent for every country? No, it can't be consistent for every country, but it's dependent on each country economic uh, needs and path for the way that uh, has them in the near future. Okay. There's a okay. question from uh, yeah. There's a question from Maron. He's asking what makes the government to borrow money during the period of budget or previous debts are not paid, even if their previous debts are not paid. Needs for investments in the market, because other than that, as I mentioned to you before, uh, if it borrows money to pay the utilities, let's call it like that, then there's that. Uh, that uh, economy is in trouble. Okay. Yeah. There is a question from Florence. He is asking, uh, the countries are increasing their fuel prices and it is impacting the cost of living. What would be the introduction of subsidiaries or certain consumer products affect the uh, government's fiscal budget? Uh, listen, uh, the uh, government is profiting from this in most of the countries because higher prices mean higher taxes. And that's why they are playing a little bit with the excess tax and the, the VAT tax. But to answer the, uh, your question, it's not the government that are increasing uh, the price of fuel, it's the market and the missing fuel that comes from it. Okay. So let us go with the next question. Um, actually, he has not posted his thing. What are the strategies government can be used to control public debt? Uh, mainly is to keep uh, the levels that are wanted by any outsiders, such as the EU or any form of other incorporations that you might have in your continent. Okay. Uh, he has asked one more question. Uh, that, that is, what are the things a country should manage in a budget before going to IMF for reliefs? Should do experiments with themselves, I mean, with the country in order if those experiments function. Okay. Uh, what are the, uh, uh, there is a question from Dr. Adam. Uh, what are the roles of subsidiary and subsidiary removal in public finance management Via public welfare, welfare concerns. Once again, I didn't hear that. Uh, what are the roles of subsidy and subsidiary removal in public finance management via uh, public welfare concern? Uh, it's dependent again on what, how much money do you have in your disposal. And this is again to the logic if you can include every citizen needs in the budget. But to be honest, it's really difficult because uh, neither, nevertheless, how much money you leave on the wealth part, never uh, this part of people is going to be happy because you can never cover their needs on how much money you give to them. Okay. There's an interesting question from Nestor. Uh, he's asking, how can environmental and social impact or assessment of a public finance project be addressed? 
Uh, in relation to the IMF or in general? Uh, no, his dress, question is just very plain. He's asked, how can environmental and social impacts or assessment of a public finance project can be addressed? Any project, I think. Uh, well, the, uh, if it's in, the, because it in, can be into forms. If it's in the form of financial aid, of course, it will be help the government because in the future, it will not leave money for the Ministry of Environment. Other than that, I don't see any logic, sorry. Okay. So uh, Peter has asked one more question. Kindly draw more light on fiscal policies, what his question is, and its impact on country's economy. Sorry, it was uh, internet interruption again. Uh, yeah, he wants to know more about a fiscal policy and its impact on country's economy. Uh, fiscal policy can destroy the economy and can make the economy gloom. Okay. This is the impact shortly. Okay. And he also wants to know how can one increase the value of our local currency? A country can increase the value of our local currency. Uh, mainly through increasing exports and uh, uh, bringing in businesses in the country. Okay, and uh, there is a most of the, yeah. most of the questions are not PFM related, though. Sorry, <laughs> they are related to policies and physicals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a question from Mark Ferris. He's asking in the case of a budget deficit, how government could improve public finance management? Uh, mainly through fiscal rules, fiscal responsibility laws and the creation of independent fiscal institutions. There is a question from ADQ. He's asking, budget deficit financing is always done through loans and debt. This has a negative impact on the cost, uh, cost of finance and economic growth. So his question is, is that uh, through the country into financial crisis, how can deficit budget be better financed in better interest of citizens? Uh, the government budget technically should include that from the beginning, but uh, other than that, it should be seen in during the way through, uh, and that's why there are uh, uh, many medium-term budget allocations that are being done in order to include everyone needs, every citizen needs. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Abraham. Uh, Abraham is asking, high inflation of United States dollars rate due to dollar shortage. What does the government, uh, I mean, like, what does government do to help to solve this inflation? Uh, the easy answer is to produce more money. Okay. Uh, but that can, it can be, needs to be seen on how the market will react because of that. Okay. Okay, I have time for two more questions, please. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll just quickly post one question. Uh, Benjamin is asking, in 90% donor-driven economy, what's the best economic and public financial policies to curb budget deficit? The logic is that you can never do that. At the end of the day, you're looking at options on how to make the economy glooming, not because that option that you're giving, it makes the economy worse. Okay, yeah, I think uh, there is just last question. Uh, There's from an anonymous, an anonymous person. His question is, does the global crisis caused by COVID-19 affect the overall execution of public uh, finance management in every country? Of course, it has changed everything. The way of thinking, the way of uh, drafting, the way of uh, making policies in any market. So there are many appreciations only that has come up. Like he has, and uh, many has posted that it has been an enlightening experience to know about public finance management. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly go give a check if all these questions are answered. Yeah, there are only uh, there is only one question from Nasser. I like I think his question has not been answered. Is okay. there any relationship between uh, governance and public finance management? No, not the direct one, but of course, if you go with the logic that the uh, fiscal policy is prepared by the Ministry of Finance, then, then yes, you have the role of uh, government in that. 
Okay, that is one. Uh, is it possible to answer one more question, doctor? Yes, please. Yeah, just a minute. I'll just. So he Leo has asked. Lee has asked, what is the criteria which allows for some countries the right to print their own currency when needed from when needed when needed and not other cannot when other countries cannot? Because it depends on the power that you have as a country. You can't compare US to some other countries, can you? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, his question is answered. Thank. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, it was a very enriching session and like many, many have joined the session and they have provided their appreciation also. It was really wonderful. And Thank you very much. Anything... Public finance, basics of public finance management were really a good topic for budget, government budgeting and everything. Yeah. Thank you very much for everything. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all participants for joining. And uh, next week, uh, we'll have an, another session. You can look around in, the, in our website for uh, various sessions in coming weeks too.